So, for those... Now, we've had you on before, but for mm-hmm. uh, for any of our listeners who haven't heard our previous interview with you, can you give us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with Legend of the Five Rings? Uh, yeah, I'm a full-time fantasy author, most well-known at the moment for Memoirs of Lady Trench, which are an alternate Victorian series about a woman who wants to study dragons as a field biologist and keeps getting into all kinds of trouble along the way. I'm also starting next year, or possibly by the time this airs this year, 2021, going to be half of M.A. Carrick, the author of the Rook and Rose epic fantasy trilogy, which starts with The Mask of Mirrors, two weeks before Night Parade comes out. So that's made my life a little exciting, trying to prep for two books at once here. But I I got involved in L5R because I am a gaming nerd, and a friend invited me to play in an L5R tabletop game, which I heard of it. I didn't know the game really at all before that point. And a little ways into me playing in that game, AEG, who owned the game at the time, basically had an open submissions call for players to send in uh, like their own suggestions for chapters for Imperial Histories 2. So I pitched them a couple, one of which was the Tobashi Dynasty, and they accepted that one. And that's how I got into writing for the RPG for that edition of the game. And then when it transferred over to Fantasy Flight, I started writing the actual fictions for the story. And from the fictions to a novella, from the novella to a novel, and here we are. So you're writing this for Aconite Press. How did you get from writing for Legend of Five Rings under FFG to end up with Aconite? How did that go about? Uh, they emailed me. I, I don't know how they assembled their list of people to approach, but I got an email from Lottie at Aconite basically saying, hey, uh, we're starting up this line of L5R novels and would like to know if you are interested. To which I said, yes, I am. <laughs> so they were putting together, it's like Nick Fury putting together. <laughs> oh, am I an Avenger now? That sounds awesome. <laughs> it's either that or Justice League, and I think we all know which one we'd rather be. I would rather yeah. be an Avenger, yeah. <laughs> Though uh, the Wonder Woman movie, quite good. So is writing for Aconite different than writing for FFG? Yeah, I, I get to use a lot more words. <laughs> <laughs> I say that uh, tongue-in-cheek, but I, I have always been a natural novelist. Like, I learned how to write short stories after I had learned to write competent novels. It did not come to me naturally. And so even though most of what I've written for Fantasy Flight has been these uh, short fictions for the game, which I, I've mentioned on the Discord and on the forum, but for anybody who's not aware, these stories were usually capped at 3,000 words or 4,000 if for the, the big events we might get to do 4,000 or for the very first stories we did. And short stories as a category for like awards goes up to 7,500. So we're definitely playing in the lower half of short story length. And that, that doesn't leave a lot of room for any kind of elaboration on stuff. Uh, you've got to keep it very streamlined. So <clears throat> getting to write first The Eternal Knot, my novella, and then Night Parade, tens of thousands of words to play with. It's beautiful. <laughs> I have all this room. But there's also a little bit of, uh, you know, not just that I have more words, but that there are things which I get asked to develop in more detail, which wouldn't be asked for in the short fictions just because there isn't room for them. And the one that struck me the most is I, I I was told to try to keep the novel, or that I had to keep the novel between 80 and 86,000 words. So I aim for this target. And it doesn't sound like that's a narrow target, but for something that size, and for somebody like me who doesn't usually outline in great detail, I'm like, okay, gotta hit a pretty precise bullseye there. And I sent in something that was about like 85, like 85,000 and change. And so 86 is my cap here. Thinking I'll tighten stuff up a little bit and add in whatever bits the editor wants. And this is usually how it goes with the short fiction. I'll send in something that's like a few hundred words short so I have room to flesh out whatever they ask for. And it comes back, and the thing that surprised me was Lottie was basically like, I want so much more from the romance like here and here. Please crank up the feelings and rip my heart out for me. Thank you. And there's not room for that kind of thing, like not just in the length of the stories, but also in the focus of the game narrative you don't get a whole lot of the, like, relationship squishy feelings development for those characters. So it was, you know, fun to go back through and say, oh, also not just with length, but in terms of focus, you want me to play up the romance rather than keeping it more focused on the monsters and the things that are going wrong. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that also really came through. But I think it worked really well. Yeah, unfortunately, Lottie said, oh, and you can go up to 90,000, which was good, because I had no idea how I was going to fit that additional <laughs> development in there and stay under 86,000 words. Yes. So I had basically like another entire short story's worth of room to play with, and I used most 4, of it. 4,000 words, but it must all be love. <laughs> Most of it, yeah. Like, I, I think the vast majority of what I added in was focused on, like, playing up, you know, why these characters were interested each, in each other, and then this is where the... Yeah. And then, why can't they just go ahead and do that? What's holding them back? Because for a romance plot, you need those obstacles of why do the characters not just go, hey, want a kiss? Sure, all right. Uh, yeah, I, one of the, one of the, uh, this is not really a spoiler, but because it's an alternating viewpoint thing, seeing... Yeah, you see one person, and then you see them through the eyes of the other person, and you completely get why stuff like that's happening. And yeah. I, I really like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's, I, I appear to have just a thing for doing dual protagonists, because my first series, which the fact that it's the doppelganger duology implies two going on right there, the Onyx Court series, generally there's two protagonists and maybe a, a couple of other minor points of view. The Wilder series, I've got two protagonists. I appear to just do that a lot, and I don't know why, but you're right that it is fun to be able to say, okay, let me play with the tension between what this person knows and what that person knows and where they don't match up. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I really like about the book, so good stuff. I'm good. So I will say, um, if doing something like what I did there of a strict alternation of like first chapter is Toto's point of view, second chapter is seconds, and so on and so forth, there's a part of me that partway through doing that went, well, rigid structure, great. So <laughs> there is one chapter which is, if you pay attention to the page count, you will notice it is markedly longer than the others because just in terms of where things went, I can't just say, okay, now we have a second Toto chapter, it's all got to be in this one. <laughs> Kids, don't try that at home. If you put yourself into a rigid structure, you then have to keep it. No. <laughs> Sometimes you can break those things for effect. Like, this is a little bit different, but I tried with the memoirs to keep the chapter lengths roughly the same. And then in the fifth book, I have one chapter that is like a quarter the length of all of the others. And I did that on purpose for effect. And it works. My, my editor was like, oh, this felt like I got, you know, punched in the face. <laughs> Good. <laughs> But it just does mean that if you break your pattern, you have to be doing it for a very clear reason and not just because, oops, I made a mess. My characters did not go where I wanted them to. How dare. Which happens sometimes. I, I can't think of any real instances in this book, but actually for many of my novels, like the bits that I'm the most proud of are the ones where I'm like, I was going to do something different there. And then the character said, no. I'm going over here. <laughs> but yeah. no. Oh, well. It means my subconscious has put things together in a way that my conscious mind wasn't doing, and so those ideas, when they happen, are pretty much always stronger than what I was going to be. All right, other future work are you looking forward to? Not, maybe not associated with this. What do you think? Uh, so I, I mentioned at the beginning, The Mask of Mirrors is coming out just two weeks before Night Parade, uh, but that's under the name M.A. Carrick, because I'm co-writing that with my friend Alice Helms. And this is an epic fantasy trilogy that is full of, like, capers and intrigue and street gangs and nobility and all that kind of stuff. I mentioned before I hate doing the elevator pitch, so for this one I usually just fall back on uh, quoting The Princess Bride, in that it has fencing, fighting, torture, revenge, giants, monsters, chases, escape, true love, and miracles. <laughs> And actually, if you know the musical, uh, The Scarlet Pimpernel, there's a song called The Riddle that I'm like, just go listen to that song. There you go. That's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a lot of identity hijinks and characters sneaking around under different personas, trying to remember what they've said to whom under which persona. And we had to make a color-coded chart at one point to keep track of that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's actually something that I'm incredibly proud of because working with Alyss, I'm... Um, it's definitely the kind of thing where both of us were pushing the other to do like more and do better than we had done before. So I think what we produced is, is very rich and intricate. Like even our editor commented, we're working on edits for the second book now. She was like, yeah, with other books you can go, yeah, to tighten up the pacing, I think you should just remove this scene. But with this one, if you pull out a scene, then there's eight other things that you then have to adjust because all of the threads you just yanked on. <laughs> nice. So it is complex. <laughs> Uh, but that comes out January 19th. Cool. And finally, where can people find you on the internet? And do you have anything else you want to plug? You can find me at swantower.com or swan underscore tower on Twitter. 
Uh, I've got a Patreon called New Worlds that is all about world building for fantasy and science fiction. And so you can find that as well. And then the M.A. Carrick stuff, that's M.A. Carrick.com, C-A-R-I-C-K. Uh, and we are M.A. underscore Carrick on Twitter, because this is what happens when the word you want is already taken by somebody else. And we've actually got a nifty thing that just went up on our website recently. There's a divinatory deck of cards in a setting called the Pattern Deck that's not just tarot with a different name. It's a, a different system that we invented. And we got somebody to create a widget for the website so you can go like do a pattern reading for yourself on our website, which we're really proud of. Nice. <laughs> That sounds fun. That's all the questions we had, unless you had something else you just were dying to tell us. <laughs> uh, everything I can think of would be spoiler kind of thing. Let me tell you all about the clever things I'm proud of that you shouldn't know until you read the book. Yep. Never mind. Go read the book. It's got, <laughs> seriously, it is a fantastic read. I read it in literally one sitting, which is not something I tend to do very often these days. <laughs> various reasons. And it was just fantastic and great fun, and the characters are amazing. Thank you. Yeah, we yeah. enjoyed it very much too. But but it, now we got to go and buy them in paper. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to having the actual physical copy in my hands because the pandemic and everything means that they only did digital advanced copies. And normally I, I get my physical advanced mm -hmm. copy and can do a little bit of a gala, my precious, over it yes. before I get the finished book. Now I got to wait for the finished <laughs> one. Like, where is it? <laughs> it's not a real book until I can hold it in my hands. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. We always love having you. And I suspect that there may be opportunities to come, you know, invite you by in the future. I certainly hope so. It's a lot of fun doing this. Um, 